Tribes of Midgard Survival Mode is here, the brand new version, and here is 69 things I wish I knew earlier, top tips to help you get better in Tribes of Midgard. If you're an old head at Tribes of Midgard, you'll know that the horns are pretty important, and what you buy or unlock is important too. Ignore the cosmetics, I know you want to look bling bling, but to help you get more, it's better to go and unlock tools and weapons, and specifically as many of the runes as possible. There's plenty of armor pieces also that can come in handy, although there should be elemental types already in the base game in survival mode, but for sure it's all about rune life. Remember none of this stuff will actually go with you when you start a new world, it just means that it will be in the pool that you can find or you'll be able to craft later on. Survival mode you can't use any of the starter kits. If you're having a massive long session and you've already accumulated a bunch of horns, make sure you quit out just for a bit and see if you can buy anything. You get golden horns as random drops from certain enemies, but the biggest amount that you'll probably get is by defeating the Jotun, the Giants. You can take a look and see what giant you're meant to go up against first, and you'll see that the rewards you get for killing each giant get multiplied. Giants do respawn every few days, but they will get increasingly harder, I do believe. So always return here with the trophies from killing them to make sure you claim your rewards. Of course the new survival mode means you can build your base anywhere, but you should still build your first encampment close to the tree, as this will still replenish your health. You don't have to worry about it being destroyed by creatures or giants, but it's still really handy in early game. When placing your forge, don't forget you can pick it up or place it down again anywhere you want, so if any time any weapons need repairing and you've got the souls, you can go ahead and repair it on the move, you don't have to return all the way back to your base. Just put down a brand new all forge and you're good to go. If you've built close to the tree of life and the standing stones, you don't really need a bed, as you'll respawn at the standing stones when you die. You get 13 days of summer, then 13 days of winter, so you won't necessarily need braziers, but I would recommend getting the campfire, because you need to feed it 500 sticks to get a self reward, so you want to be having that up as running, and always just dump as many sticks in it as you can as you go past. Make sure you pick up a fishing rod as soon as possible as well. There are limited drops where you can fish, so it's important to get as much fish as you go as whenever you see the bubbles rising in a river or at the ocean. Tribes has been out a while, so I don't really feel like I'm going to go through all the basics of just gathering certain resources, but you get the idea. Chop down every bit of tree in sight and make sure you look out specifically for stone and iron. There are no classes in survival mode, so make sure your blessings you choose the right ones to begin. There is a max cap of 50, so you can only have 50 blessings activated out of a total of 90. If you're playing solo, you really want to go for double the amount of ingredients while harvesting. It's going to take 3 blessing points to get, but it's definitely what I would go for first. Maybe if you're planning a large group, it's not as important, but for sure, solo or small groups, you want to get as much resources as possible to alleviate the grind, which there's a lot of. Next, I'd also aim to get the extra rune slot, so you can hold 6 runes. Remember, you can hold up to 30 now, but you can only equip 6 at any time, so you can swap, mix and match whenever you want, and this is vital for giving you some extra buffs and bonuses. That's what your first 5 blessing points should be spent on. Also, runes don't always stack. If it's a percentage chance it says on the rune, that won't stack. So if anything says it gives you 20% more damage against a certain creature, if you had four of them runes equipped, it's not going to give you 80%. The only thing that stacks is when it's got a damage number or a healing number. So if it says it's going to heal you by 50, then you should get the stack where it'll heal you by 150 if you had three of them. And then last tip on runes, I would go for anything that gives you extra health. There's a couple that will give you 20%, that means you've used up 7 blessings, and if you go for the 40%, that means 9 blessings, you'd have got all the stuff that I just mentioned. The map is massive, it's got a fog of war of course, but you can buy maps from traders. These can show you where other traders are, hideouts, plus if you talk to the NPC, it should show the location of the next giant that you have to go and kill. You can meet later traders that will show you the locations of the Ancients. These are the bosses that you take on after the first four giants. Don't waste your souls on it. It will pop up with the next Ancient once you've killed the fourth giant, Agraboda. Don't be afraid to use your recall stone. It does replenish quite quickly and it's better to save them souls. Remember, you still lose 75% of your souls now if you die. However, if you do die, you don't lose your weapons or your armor. You only lose the gathered materials that you've been gathering. Try and always have at least one portal shrine on you when you're going to explore new lands. You never know when you've gone maybe a bit too far and you really find it's a good spot to go ahead and put one down. You get the ancient cause to craft it from the giants as well as a bunch of elite enemies. Lots of the more advanced items you won't be able to see where they're crafted until you start crafting all of these benches. 
Things like the defenses bench, the artifact altar where you get your quest to go and take on the ancient bosses, not to mention the potion stand, they're all locked. You're going to need also drop some giants to go ahead and craft some of that. So as always, if you've got the resources, make as many of the crafting benches as possible to see what's next and focus on upgrading certain ones. Avoid wasting resources, min max your opportunities and don't bother with base items until much later. Yeah, you may want to make a nice little viking cabin, but you don't really need it as long as you choose the right location. Check to see that an area doesn't have any enemies spawning and as long as you've built maybe one high or two high on top of some of the cliffs, you should be okay from other enemies. There's plenty of smaller spots and the enemies can never jump up, they can only ever jump down. You can use the natural landscape to give you protection like cliffs as walls as well. Focus on making the lumber stand. This will give you the opportunity to make the mining and the tannery and this is what you're going to need because there are no farms in survival mode. These are a must for getting upgraded so that you can go ahead and get more refined materials and make better armor, weapons and more. During the summer you won't have to worry about clothes so focus on just getting enough materials to make either the crafting benches or certainly get some weapons. Even at night time you should just about be okay. Weapon losses, durability or maybe want to save? Then take some walls for a little run and let them do the hard work. The Land of Pools is where you get your silver and loads of ore as well as plenty of stone. But also don't forget the mushrooms. You especially want to visit this place because the mushrooms will help in making foods and potions later on. But it's the night time that you really want to visit. As the lightning mushrooms that you gather, they will help you craft the Norna arm sets later. And it's one of the best early to mid game sets you can get. If that's news to you, don't forget as well that lots of trees, bushes and certain resources give you different types of resource at night time. You won't be making potions for a good while yet, so make sure you're stocked up at least on as much food as possible and upgrade the cooking stove quickly. Don't ignore hell things just because they're a bit tough at night time. You need the hell thing fingernails as well as the rings that they drop. So many of the late game armors require this. So stock up now. Elites can be recognised by the yellow bar above their heads and if you really haven't got a decent armour or a weapon, you better get out of there. They should only be taken on if there's at least more than one of you. If in danger, flop your bow out. You can always keep a bunch of enemies at range. If you keep them just to the edge or off screen, they'll generally leave you alone or won't head straight for you. But do remember that your special moves that you have to build up, sometimes they don't go as far as your regular attacks, so you have to get a bit closer to unleash the full force. Respawned in your bed and can't get out, that's because you built your house too short. It needs to be free high or you'll keep getting stuck in the ceiling. If you've been harvesting the whole land around you, it might start looking like a wasteland, but don't worry, everything respawns. Trees respawn quicker than some of the other resources, so don't be afraid to go ahead and chop as many as you can. This is the quickest way also to build up your XP other than taking on enemies. You don't need stairs to get yourself higher, you can go ahead and use roof ramps, just make sure you've got them correctly aside wherever you want to get up. So always make sure you've got at least three, possibly even six, whenever you're going off adventuring. Not to mention that stairs are a little bit more expensive to make, so always have some around so you can go and get the treasure chests that are marked out by the little squares in a pyramid shape. These will have a ton of resources and XP. You might want to just roll past certain defences off cliffs, but make sure you go through them as they can often drop decent resources. You can upgrade the shipyard to access some of the other boats that have more health and they also give you more space for other players. But unless you really need it because you've got more players, I wouldn't bother. As long as you're pretty careful and you're not using the same ship to sail around the whole of the map, you should be fine enough to get from one point to another and then put down a teleport stone. A lot of the resources needed to upgrade this shipyard can definitely go better towards other stuff and other crafting stations, so really view the upgrades as a luxury once you've got everything else made. Don't forget as soon as you're standing on land you can repair your ship as well if it does take any damage. If you do die in the water and you're really worried about getting your loot, don't forget you can also buy the Valkyrie boxes from traders and that will give you all your loot in one go. Different traders sell different things, the ones close to you in the bright forest sell some basic stuff and it does get more expensive to buy resources from some of the others. So one way to deal with that is buy souls potions, these will cost you 700 souls and you only get to say 500 of them but it does mean you can stockpile souls for later when you come across more useful traders. Traders don't rotate their items so focus on the XP potions and making sure you buy plenty of good runes that help you. 
Try and get your tools upgraded as quickly as possible. As you gain more resources, the better quality they are. When making more refined materials, don't forget you can also refine things like flint into stone or stone into flint, like vice versa. This is super useful if you do need just one or two extra cut stones. And the same thing goes for raw iron and pretty much all the other resources. The exception to this is fur and yarn. It takes a lot of fur to make one yarn, six in fact. There is a build limit of 500 pieces until the devs work on it a bit more. So be careful about what you build and this is why you should be super careful about your base location. Unlike Saga mode where you share all your resources directly from the community chest and don't have to go and grab them individually to go and buy stuff with the traders, you have to have the inventory on you when you go to craft stuff in survival. Want to carry more potions? Make sure you get the right blessing for it which you can find in the blessings tree. Increasing potion stacks is absolutely a game changer. Once you've got the basics and you do want to decide on a permanent base location, make sure it is the one. Every time you place something down, you only get partial resources back and some of these crafting benches become a real chore to upgrade again. That's right, even if you've upgraded your armor bench to level four, if you dismantle it, you're gonna to have to spend a whole ton of resources upgrading it all the way back up to that level. Enemies will come and destroy your base or any of your construction pieces if they're close enough, but they won't necessarily home in every night like they do in Saga mode. A simple fence is good enough to keep most of them out unless you've built somewhere particularly dangerous like another one of the bigger biomes or most dangerous advanced ones. When it comes to weapons, look for the opposites again. If you spend a lot of time in the land of pools, then anything with void damage is usually better than something with lightning damage. That's because the vast majority of enemies in the land of pools are more resistant to lightning damage. Arrows are your best friend for taking out more elite style enemies or the giants. Just make sure it's the opposite elemental damage type. Just like you research enemies, make sure you research resources. I've said it a few times, but use the journal and work out where stuff is. Gold was one of the most requested and you pretty much get this in the hideouts and the underpasses. And keep track of what enemies drop also. Spend your souls on runes early on to really help you out, but eventually you will just get loads and loads and probably are going to have to destroy a couple even to fit into your 30 inventory slot. You can't share runes with other players. Enemy camps are a great way also to go ahead and get loads of XP, so don't pass up the opportunity to clear one out. And they normally have one or two chests also worth looting. If you're running low on health but you're going to be okay, don't use all of your resources to replenish it if you're close to a level up. As soon as you level up, you regain all your health. You don't have to leave a session either to spend all of your season XP. Them little purple drops that occasionally drop from defeating enemies, that automatically goes towards your season rewards and your tracker. The only thing you might have to quit, like I said earlier, is now and then check that you haven't got loads of new runes or unlocked tools and weapons from completing some of the survival challenges. Them types of rewards you will have to leave your world and check in the main menu to see if you can claim them. Of course, never abandon the world though, that means you have to restart completely all over again. When you are crafting the armor and weapons, don't always just pay attention to their base stats. It's usually about what elemental bonuses they give you, that's the most important thing. As there's not much difference between a 79 ember bow and an Utgard bow, it's all about what they do with the elemental damage. You will pick up supply of weapons from enemies, but normally they're quite slow or they'll end up just not being as good as the stuff you've already got by the time you're exploring further lands. You should hopefully be able to find a trader that you might be able to sell some of that stuff to later on. Mix up your weapons. You might find it easier just to use a sword and your shield, but it's really important that if there's another weapon that has the right elemental damage and you can get it without having to unlock a further crafting bench, you use that to take on elites and some of the giants. So don't be afraid to mix up the weapons that you use. It really will help you get through some of the bosses, some of the harder creatures a bit easier, and always make sure you've got at least two melee weapons on you. You need an absolute ton of yarn to upgrade and buy new armor pieces, and you can make it out of fur once you upgrade the tannery, or head to an ash beach and pretty much take out any of the unsunken, as they will always drop at least one piece of yarn. Don't ignore critters, and in this case, crabs. These are really useful for making ice arrows or ice exploding arrows, especially useful for taking on Hologi. You can also make protecting brew, invisibility soup, and jar of Jotunheim out of them as well. And in general, never pass up the opportunity to get critters. They often drop fur or feathers or just other resources you really need. If you've managed to find crows, they'll even maybe drop some gold. 
In Saga mode as well, you use souls to repair your tools and weapons. But because there isn't as many uses for souls in survival, you can probably get away with repairing more. That said, it's still worth keeping some of your broken tools and weapons and double checking that you haven't got an upgrade available as that will replenish the durability on that weapon when you upgrade it. It's not super clear exactly how much damage the cold or the heat does. When you look at the thermometer on the top left, pretty much where that white line is, that means it's going to be too cold and you will take some sort of damage. Likewise, if it's in the red, you're going to take too much heat damage. The white line acts as what you've basically got on. So if you haven't got enough armor and it's in the blue, you're going to take damage. The baselines of cold and heat do change depending on what season, so they may be slightly smaller bars as well. Temperatures remain the same depending on what stage of day it is. So it doesn't get cold at any point during the day, except when it gets to dusk time, that little orange part on the compass in the top right. Then it'll get a little bit colder. And of course, when it gets to the dark part, which is night time, it's gonna get even colder. The exception to this course is what biome you're in at the time. Obviously the ice biome is gonna be much colder. Also the ash beach is often colder than other parts. Even during winter, some of the hottest biomes will still do you damage if you're exploring at night time like the desert. So absolutely get hold of the cold blood rune. This gives you 100 healing every time you take cold damage and it's pretty OP. It will actually do the job, just one of these runes, to make you survive in the glacier peaks even wearing no armour. Might be a bit different in the coldest of winters at night time, but certainly even while taking on a yacht in here, Gerador, I had no problem at all. I did have just one of these runes equipped. Anytime you come across a trader or you put down one of your fast travel points, that will also protect you against the cold and heat as long as you stay close to it. Hideouts are multi-level dungeons. You'll have to go through and pretty much keep diving down two or three levels before eventually you get to the end. Sometimes the switch needed to activate the trap door might not be right next to it, it might be the other side of the caves. So have a good look around and pay attention. If you find in the hideouts too tough to deal with, don't forget you can get some runes that give you extra damage while underground. It's a good idea also to have the decoy equipped here so lots of enemies focus on that and use the jars that are scattered all around usually to take out some of the bigger enemies. Also don't forget that bigger enemies will do damage to smaller ones if they hit them. This actually goes for pretty much all the bigger enemies like the Lindhorn and others. If you find it impossible to get into another area of the desert as there's no beaches or way up, that's how you access it via the underpasses. Zelkies and the guys with the harps can be some of the toughest enemies in the game, especially when they're together. You've got to take care of the guy with the harp first because he will strengthen the others. Zelkies apply a slow debuff on you as well when in combat, so be careful. And if you've been wondering where to get the selfie flippers, well this is where you get them, but sometimes they're disguised as actual seals. Generally, any of the seals that are close to spawn on the continent that you start on, they won't be selkies, they'll just be regular seals. You won't find the channeling ones until you go to the ash beaches much further out. Selkie flippers are super useful as you need it to upgrade the tannery, and I do believe the armor stand as well. I'll explain how you unlock the artifact altar when we talk about Agrabodo in a second. But with these fragments, you can get a bunch of them quite easily. The event fragments will pop up as the yellow little symbols on the map. Pet a special stag or kill some chickens. That's how you get the event ones. The Jotun fragments you get from killing the giants. And obviously the hideout fragments you get from completing hideouts. So the only ones you really need to buy are the ones that you get on un unlock level two. And that's pretty much it. I'm gonna finish off this video with a little mini detail guide on how to take on every single one of the first four giant bosses. Look out for a separate video in the future to take a look at all the other bosses, the ancients in the game, and maybe some more advanced tips. Hope you found this useful. If you have, leave a like, make sure you're subscribed, and I'll see you right back later. The Yotun all have their own special moves and of course strengths and weaknesses, but in survival mode they're all quite a bit more difficult because they're not going in one direction. In Saga they pretty much head towards your main settlement, but now, now they've got their own kind of movement, they will do quicker damage to you. So you've got to get a few hits in and then jump out of the way. Gen Saxar, you want to have dark energy tools and any armor that gives you protection against shock or lightning. A lot of the early game weapons that you can craft with elemental damage will be dark, so you can go ahead and use this on her. She has two forms. First form will pretty much be this, and it's pretty dangerous. She has a bunch of melee attacks, and these yellow orbs will come and hunt you down. You basically have to stand still, wait for them to go red, and then dive out of the way. There is some thinking that you could potentially hit them or knock them out, 
but I find it easier just to let them do their thing and then you just jump out of the way. All of the giants regain their health pretty much constantly. They'll do it even quicker if you're not close to them. So make sure you've got a bed outside as a respawn point or you've crafted one of the teleporter altars so you can get here back quickly. Jansax's second form is pretty much a massive giant tornado. She'll spawn a totem and that's what you should try to destroy first. If then bolts of lightning actually hit you, it does a huge amount of damage. So always focus on the totem first before doing any other moves on Jansaxa directly. Halogi could be one of the easiest bosses to face, even though he's technically the second one. He's got six different types of attacks, but most of them can be avoided by just going behind him. But first it will be the sword kind of stab, and that does a huge area of effect damage. Then he's got the sword slice, which again does a massive amount of damage right in front of him. Then he'll spit a huge amount of molten lava and fire in a wide cone in front of him. Obviously use lots of ice arrows and then watch out for the fireballs that come at you. That's probably the fourth biggest one. You'll generally use this if you're a bit farther out in range. Having a decoy rune is really effective for taking him out and keeping him at range as well when he's doing obviously the big area effect. But otherwise you should get up close and personal with him and you can do a huge amounts of him. Actually, he does have a little foot stamp as well that can do quite a bit of burning damage. Don't be too put off by jumping into the puddles of lava. They only actually do damage initially when they land. But he really does move so slowly, you should be able to get out of the way of most of the damage. Defeating Halogi is how you unlock the potions bench. So make sure you go and make this inside, obviously, the cooking stand when you get back. You may have needed at least some sort of armor when taking on Halogi. You'll definitely need some when taking on Gerador, the ice giant, as he's in obviously the Glacier Peaks biome. The worst one to use is the Raider set, otherwise the Norna set isn't too bad, and even the Hersa set might just be enough as long as you've got the rune of cold blood. Now Gerador is a bit like Halogi, he's pretty slow, as long as you stay behind him, you're mostly avoiding a lot of the damage, and you just gotta get out of the way of his ground pounds and foot stumps. Should go without saying that any fire weapons will be better to deal with him. Not usually too many swords in early game, but you should find at least some axes and more to take him on. Otherwise, it should be fairly easy to craft a bunch of fire arrows if you've gone venturing into the desert and got Brennerfowl Amber and stuff. His attacks are very similar to Logi. Like I said, he'll do a foot stump, he'll do a one-handed pound, and then a two-handed pound. The two-handed is one of the most deadly that you've got to get out of the way of, and it's got the widest range. He also can throw ice balls at you as well, and you've got to be on the lookout for that temperature going down in his arena, which is extremely cold. Now, he's pretty unique because you need a lot of his pieces to craft some of the late game armor, the ones that are freely available normally. And if you want to make defensive traps starting with watchtowers, you're going to need his jaws for that. Agroboda is absolutely one of the toughest giants to go up against, hence why she's number four. Her biome will be in one of the Ash Beach biomes and it is definitely one of the toughest. You've got the Selkie running around here which is really hard drop to get hold of with the seals themselves. And the temperatures at winter time can be pretty brutal also around here. Anything with lightning damage is obviously going to be better and obviously you want protection against the void or the dark. She's so tough because she has these three pools that do damage. She also summons hell things that will come and take you with some more advanced ones. And she's also got a hand that will pop out of the ground and basically drag you in. If you get caught in one of these circles, it takes a huge amount of damage. So you've got to get out of the way as quickly as possible. The only plus point is that it does also do damage to even the minions. She's pretty stationary as well. She doesn't move around as much as some of the others. This is one where you really do want to mix up a lot of close combat and range. The hand is probably also one of the most deadliest. If that comes out and grabs you, then it's really hard to get away sometimes. You have to be fully away from it. Any additional healing that you can get, whether it's through like the sapling room or the passive regen, or even be able to stand still for three seconds. But do be wary with the health things approaching as well. It can be a challenge. You might also want to go for one of the rooms that gives you bonus healing every time you kill an enemy or drops 200 health. Ideally, you're looking for weapons that will create a pool that will just constantly do damage to her. And yeah, you might have to stay at arm's length quite a bit more. As I said, the hands that come out can be really hard to see them amongst a bunch of hell things hitting you, as well as all the other effects going on. Defeat her though, and you'll get access to the artifact table. And that's what you're going to need to go and then find the ancients and unlock their portals or their rooms. 
You'll have to upgrade it up to four times before you can actually get all the pieces needed to go and take on the ancient bosses. So you more than likely will have to pretty much start farming some of the previous giants. Or certainly taking on as many elites as possible. So there you go, 69 things I wish I knew earlier about Tribes of Midgard survival mode. Let me know how you're getting on, give me your top tips if I didn't include them in this video, and look out for a more advanced one when I take on the Ancients and more. Until next time, Ratbags, laters.